doctors. What is your most surprising, I can't believe I need to have this conversation with an adult, story? This will be a long story. When I was an internal medicine resident, I came across a very nice 50-year-old Dominican lady. She was well-mannered, but one could tell she was not the sharpest tool in the shed. As I was prepping her chart for her first visit, I noticed that she'd been seen by every single digestive disease MD in her hospital system. Not only that, she had every single procedure in the book. Ranging from endoscopies of both holes and culminating in an exploratory laparotomy, you're opened up to basically look inside you and we have no clue what's going on. All of this because for years she had one single complaint. She reported severe gnawing pain in her stomach. At this point, I should mention that she was speaking Spanish only. Not only that, she had a very heavy Dominican accent, and I was the first Hispanic doctor to ever see her. Her first language is Spanish, and I even had difficulty understanding her. So she comes in, and after exchanging some first-time pleasantries, I politely ask her how she's doing. Sure enough, although she was smiling and said she felt well, she pointed at her belly and said it was biting again, and asked for the cream to kill it. At this point, I got intrigued. Her medication list only mentioned a cream used for her breakthroughs. The previous fellow only mentioned in his note that in every single visit, she only asks for the cream and nothing else. When I asked what she meant by the biting and what she intended to do with the cream, she very calmly told me she intended to stick the cream up where the sun doesn't shine in order to kill the bird living inside her. After delving more deeply into her story, it turns out she didn't have a medical condition. Ever since she was a little girl, she believed that after eating a whole quail egg, the bird had spawned inside her and gnawed away in her insides whenever she was very hungry. After a short visit to psych, she was diagnosed with a somatic type delusional disorder. No amount of medication or psychotherapy will cure her, but she was still a fully functional mother of two who paid her taxes and had two part-time jobs. I reached out to every digestive disease doctor in our hospital system once more to make sure she never received an inappropriate invasive intervention. I've been following her now for three years and she's happy as one can be, considering she has a bird living inside her. What a way to start this video, huh? Turns out this lady was just cuckoo. Story 2. My significant other is a med student. He helped to diagnose a 40-year-old woman who finally sought out a doctor after having open infected wounds on her entire torso for over a year. The open wounds only appeared after more than a year of painful, visible lumps on her chest. She had never sought treatment prior to this. Significant other had to inform her that her entire body was ridden with a cancer, that there was no treatment to help her, and that she would be dead very soon. Her sister, who was there the entire time, began loudly proclaiming what a shame it was that nothing could ever have been done, and that hopefully someday we would be able to detect cancer sooner. Significant other watched the doctor explain that pretty much any other woman in the country would have gotten effective treatment at the first sign of the lumps. This was during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Another time, my significant other had a 70-ish year old woman come in with complaints of small but painless growth that was visible at the back of her throat. Turns out it took her 70 years to notice her uvula. Story 3. Patient comes to the ER, a 19-year-old male. I'm getting his history. Why are you here today? Every morning when I wake up, my stomach hurts. How long has it been hurting? All my life. Now what is different today that's made you come here? My girlfriend doesn't think that is normal. More questions. Exam by ER physician, lab tests. The abdominal pain always goes away after he eats. Always. He wakes up hungry. He thinks it is pain. A very pleasant 50-something lady came in for a physical. Everything was going fine when she casually asked if there were any new vaccines out. She was up to date with everything, so I asked if she had any specific concerns. She was casually asking to see if she could vaccinate her gay adult son against homosexuality. Very nice, always had a smile on her face, even when I broke the bad news to her. A 32-year-old grown man asked me if the hot spells he was experiencing at night meant he was going through menopause. Nope, that's menopause. Okay, I think I'm enjoying the puns today. Well, at least it's punny. Story 4. My mom tells it so much better, but here's a try. My mom was the head nurse at a clinic here in Houston in the 80s. She worked for an old World War II doctor that had gone to private practice. Old school GP, when he returned back to the States. Well, one afternoon she told me that they had a patient come in that was running high fever and was complaining of pain in her pelvic area. Mom also tells me that there was a stench coming from the woman's lap that could only be described as enough to gag a maggot off a meat wagon. She begins to interview the patient who told her that she and her boyfriend had been active and that she has been in pain since. She thought that the woman may have contracted an STD and asked her to undress and wait for the doctor to examine her. The doctor arrives and closes the door, only to reopen it a few seconds later, mentioning the need for fresh air. The doctor noticed that there was a discharge and began to question the patient about her intimate life. Was it protected, non-protected, etc.? According to mom, the patient told her, No, doc, we always use a rubber. The doctor looked down and noticed that there is a small rubber band extending from the woman's lady bits. The doctor reached in with his gloved hand and pulled it out. What came next can only be described as a magician pulling the magic cloth out of someone's mouth. One rubber band after another came out over the course of the next 10 minutes. Finally, once they were all removed, the doctor had the talk with the woman about education and that rubber bands were not a successful contraceptive and not what they meant by wearing a rubber, and then wrote her a prescription for ABX. Story 5. 
I was a newly minted graduate with fresh and optimistic views on my life as a doctor. Second week, in came this old lady and her very dysfunctional family. They would argue and complain about everything, from the food, the nurses they didn't like, and every single medical decision we made. She was very, very sick, so her management was just as complicated. She had several children, and they all didn't like one another and would not talk to one another. Each time, we would have to explain a long update to every single one of them because they are entitled to hear it from a doctor. One of these stories is sitting down and explaining why you don't give Gatorade as an IV drip. They did not understand why we were giving salt water to her. Conversation with her son. Look, she likes Gatorade, she's drinking it, so why can't you give it to her through her drip? We explain why. Yes, but Gatorade is more electrolytes. We explain again. Salt water just seems to be too cheap. Can you give her something else closer to Gatorade that has electrolytes? Continues for two hours. Wash and repeat every day during her admission. Afterwards, I told my fiancé. He opened up a scene from Idiocracy on YouTube and I just sat there with my mouth open for a while. Story 6. While in dermatological rotation, a Middle Eastern patient saw me with what she described as some funny, itching growth. Some quick investigation revealed it to be a severe case of genital warts. I explained the diagnosis and that it was an S until she shockingly assured me that she was still a virgin. Now virginity is a big issue for young Muslim women, or perhaps their families even more. But apparently that doesn't cover backdoor intimacy and therefore no birth control in the form of, say, rubber was needed. Once, I worked with a guy who had some sort of blood thinning meds at lunch. For half an hour afterwards, he couldn't stand bright light. I had just the normal overhead lights in the warehouse, a lot dimmer than sunlight. He told me it was heart medication and the doctor had told him to fix his diet. His diet, at least lunch at work, was like a full English breakfast. Two eggs, bacon, sausages, all fried, plus toast. He also told me he wasn't about to change a damn thing, that if he had to give up the food he liked, he might as well be dead. I thought then that he was a sad dude if the only thing worth living for was his greasy food. He was married, too, to a very nice lady. I shared another story, but this time with a colleague being the one acting stupidly. This was when I finally made it to neuroradiology. And in comes this mother whose maybe three, four months old son we would scan today because she had epileptic seizures after his birth. Apparently, the pediatricians didn't tell her about the fits nor the severe neurological birth defects they knew about for weeks, so I had to explain to her that her child had mental disabilities. That was probably the first time I flipped out on a colleague I didn't even know over the telephone and in the heat of the moment, wanted to find this idiot and spit in his face. He was totally oblivious of how he screwed up, saying there was a language barrier while this hospital employs a whole department of translators just for such cases. How the hell did he decide to just not tell her because of a language barrier? Someone needs to get fired, and honestly, I would have flipped out too. Story 7. My brother is a general practitioner in rural Tennessee. Enough said, right? He says most of his patient visits go about like this. MD. Well, person, you're pre-diabetic, have high blood pressure, and are complaining about joint pain. Have you been exercising and cutting out sugar and carbs? Yeah, I have, doc, but it doesn't seem to help. Do you have any better meds you could prescribe? MD. Well, let's talk about your diet. How much water do you drink a day? person. I don't like water, so I get extra ice in my sweet tea every day to make sure I get enough water. MD. Explains how that's not enough water by a long shot. How much sweet tea are you drinking every day? They can have a lot of sugar in them. Person. Well, I get a large one from Hardee's or McDonald's or wherever on my way to work with my breakfast, and another one on my way home for dinner. Then I have a glass or two when I get home. MD. Well, that's a lot of sugar and a lot of fast food if you're eating it twice a day. What do you eat at home? Person. I don't like to cook, so I usually don't eat anything but Little Debbie snack cakes at home. MD. Those have a lot of sugar, too. Person. I thought that all I had to do was cut out Mountain Dew. Now you're saying I can't eat my food or my snacks? But are you suggesting I do eat salads for every meal? Why can't you just up my meds? Ugh. Reading his diet made my pancreas curl. I like sugar, too, but that is too much. But you know what isn't too much? Asking you to hit that like button and subscribing to my channel. Please. Story 8. I was working in GP and had a patient scheduled for an appointment. Looked through his notes to gain an idea of why he may be seeing me and saw he'd been seen a few times with knee pains or shoulder pains and the like. The guy's in his 70s, so probably just arthritis. I'm thinking I'll do an examination of his sore joints and ask a few questions. Prescribe some painkillers and it'll be a quick one. Call him in and he walks in, sits down and as cheery as anything. What seems to be the problem then, sir? I notice you've had some issues recently with sore joints, I ask. He then proceeds to tell me about this sore knee. So I check his sore knee and take a history and it all seems fine. Ask anything else and he's like, oh, actually my neck is sore too. So I checked his neck and nothing untoward to be found there either. At this point, he's like, okay, well, thanks doc, I'll be off then. I said to him, oh good, I'm glad we could help. And you have no other pains at all before you go? 
He then sits back down and tells me he's been having central crushing chest pain radiating down his left arm and into his jaw since last night, and has been feeling breathless, and when it happened, he had an impending sense of doom. I know a lot of you won't be doctors here, but I'm sure you all recognize signs of an MI there. He had all the classic textbook symptoms. Called an ambulance, and he was rushed to the hospital for PCI, precutaneous coronary intervention. Thread a catheter up to the arteries into the coronary artery to find and then treat the blockage. Sorry for the medical acronym. To sum things up, man came in complaining of arthritis and when he was about to leave, decided to tell me he had a heart attack the night before and thought nothing of it. Story 9. I'm a GP in a small town British medical center. Older lady came into one of the day clinics with a large shopping bag emitting a foul smell. So much so we gave her the special treat reserved for smelly patients waiting in the doctor's corridor instead of the waiting room, having received complaints from the other patients. Said older lady comes into my office for her appointment and sits down, asks me how big the largest poo I've ever seen, as a doctor, was. I demur and explain I don't actually see as much poo as one might imagine as she proceeds to tell me an epic tale. For the week before her appointment, she'd had the worst case of constipation she'd ever had. She tried and tried but could not go to the toilet no matter how much olive oil or licorice she'd consumed. Then, the day before the clinic, she felt the urge and found herself doing the longest poop I've ever seen. It just kept coming and coming and coming. So fascinated was she by her enormous poo that she couldn't bring herself to flush it. I picked it out of the toilet, put it in a waterproof shopping bag, and showed her friends who, she says, told her she must show it to a medical professional, because we'd just be fascinated to see such a large, unusual stool. And then she opened the bag and showed it to me, which filled it. It filled the entire bag. Recently, paramedics transported an idiot who self-presented to the local hospital, who found he was having a heart attack, STEMI, and needed him sent to a bigger hospital for treatment. During my assessment, I asked him how long he'd been having chest pain. On and off for 12 months, he tells me. Any family history? One of the biggest indicators. Oh yes, dad died of a heart attack. Brother died of a heart attack, both of them first presentation, stone dead on the spot. No beating around the bush. So you have a 12-month history of intermittent chest pain and a family history of your closest male relatives spontaneously chucking hearties and dying. And you've never got it investigated. Furthermore, the only reason you came to the hospital tonight is because your family badgered you into it. I told him he needed a solid kick in his behind. To his credit, he agreed. Story 10. Dentist here. Things I've had to explain to parents. Number one, breast milk can cause cavities. Number two, don't put your kids to bed with a bottle with Coke in it. They then switch to Diet Coke. Face palm. Number three, don't wiggle out your permanent teeth just because the tooth fairy will give you money. Number four, you can't brush cavities away with toothpaste or any of these new internet fads. Oil pulling, honey, chocolate. Once your cavity is deep enough, it needs to be fixed by a dentist. Number five, fluoride isn't poison any more than table salt is poison. Small quantities are good for you. Anyone who tells you otherwise has been lied to and believed it. I have plenty more, but I'd have to think harder. I had a few questions about number three. There was a little guy, probably eight years old or so, that had wiggled out his four lower permanent incisors, front teeth. After wiggling out his four baby teeth in the corresponding spots because his family made such a big deal about giving him money from the tooth fairy, they were in my office asking when the new teeth would be coming in. Had to tell them, never. Incisors only have one root typically, and when it first erupts, it is not completely developed and the tooth is still moving through bone, so it isn't really firm in place, yet. This kid capitalized on a single-rooted, undeveloped, erupting tooth and with a little elbow grease and the promise of riches was able to tough it out. Little dude was looking for a quick payout, huh? I respect the hustle, but maybe he should have just asked his mom for some extra. Story 11. My mother is a doctor. She once told me this story about a patient she had. She serves low-income people, so typically immigrants or minorities, usually without health insurance. The man is from Central America and is there for a normal checkup. Typical for most patients, he has fairly high blood pressure. However, this man is also having bowel problems. So my mother asks, What color inconsistency is your stool when you need to use the bathroom? The man has no idea what she's talking about. My mom tries again. Your poop. What color and or consistency is it typically? The man still has no clue what she's saying. He understands a bit of English. She tries again. Your doo-doo. Nothing. Your fecal matter. Nothing. Your poo. Nothing. Not number one, but number two. Nothing. Finally, she asks, it's not liquid when it comes out, but it's more solid. You know, the man has an epiphany. Oh, you mean sh**, he says. Yes, you're sh**. So my highly educated professional mother has to continue the rest of the checkup asking about his sh**. What color is your sh**? Is it more wet? Does it hurt when you try? This went on for a fair amount of time. My mom nearly bursts out laughing by the end of it. Absolutely amazing what a minor language barrier can do. Story 12. In medical school, I did a forensic psychiatry rotation. Part of this rotation involved working at the courthouse, trying to do assessments of people accused of crimes in an attempt to see if they were competent to stand trial. 
Sometimes those with severe mental health issues obviously aren't competent to stand trial. Sometimes those accused were obviously trying to fake being mentally ill to try to get out of the trial. But in a few cases, there were people with some issues, but they weren't really bad issues. They just needed a little education in the U.S. judicial system and how it works. So they put together a class in the judicial system for the province of D.C. with no mental health issues, but just no education in how a trial works. And who would be the best person to lead these classes? The rotating medical student, of course. So, my name is medical student Nightingale, and we are here today to talk about how the trial system works. Let's start with going through the courtroom and talking about who is who. For instance, who is the person who sits behind the big bench at the head of the room? The judge. That's right. And what does the judge do? He says, order in the court. Yes, he does, but he also is the person in charge of the trial. And in many cases, he's the person who you need to convince that you are innocent of a crime. Who is the lawyer that sits next to you? He's the freaking man. Yes, he is. He's your defense attorney. He's there to help you plead your case about why you are innocent or why you don't deserve a harsh punishment. Who is the other lawyer in the room? The pro- No, actually, you are the pro- in this case. He's the prosecution. Though, to be fair, some people don't see much of a difference. That was a long rotation. I learned a lot about the difference between doctors and lawyers and how being uneducated leads not only to poor medical care, but also to not being able to defend yourself in court. Story 13. Not a doctor, but I was driving for a Chinese family in the middle of July in California. Their kids got car sick and started throwing up everywhere. They put jackets on the kids and asked me to roll up the windows and turn the air conditioner off. I refused and made them choose either windows open or AC full blast, because they were 100% convinced that being cold causes stomach problems. It was like 103 degrees outside. I couldn't convince them that no, cold temperatures do not in fact cause nausea, but overheating does. They only listened after we had a tire blow out, and while we were pulled over, a trooper told us to get in the vehicle, crank up the AC, and take the kids' jackets off because the heat is dangerous. The mom is one of the smartest people I know otherwise. She's a professor and is really quick and sharp at understanding concepts that are way above my head in our field. I don't know how humanity isn't extinct yet after reading all the stories. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy. Doctors, how did you know your patient was faking? Story 2 is funny. See you on that video.